Okay. Um, can everybody see the slides okay? Yep, yeah, fantastic, great. Um, I can't actually, I don't know how to now turn off my video, Nessa, so can you do that from your end? Um, okay, so what is near me? So, um, Near Me is a video consultation platform which has been around in Scotland for a couple of years now. Um, it's a very simple system and in it, it enables clinical consultations and um, social care consultations to take place using connections from wherever the clinician may be with the individual who needs the support. And that support can take place at home, at work, or any other location. In March 2020, of course, we had um, a sudden change to our lives because of the COVID-19 situation. And Trish Greenall is a professor down in Oxford who's undertaking the external review of Near Me for Scottish use. And um, she commented that suddenly the relative advantage of video consultations has changed dramatically. And indeed it did. Um, we have significant change in use. <clears throat> in February, we had 300 calls a week. Oops. We had 300 calls a week taking place using Near Me consultations. Two weeks ago, that had increased to 13,000 per week. So this, this diagram, as you can see, it's from the 1st of March, and it's showing the week on week changes and increases. So that's covering um, GPs, primary care, secondary care, and some um, consultations through um, third sector providers as well. It's been a huge, huge change. So to date, what has um, near been near me being used for a whole range of different clinical purposes. This is just some, it's not all by means. I could probably do three slides like this with all of the different aspects. It really has been quite um, significant, the, the range that's taken place. Today, these have been in pockets across Scotland. There isn't necessarily a whole service that is using it. Um, but indeed, we have got such an amount of learning that had taken place that then we've utilised in the last few weeks in order to really make that difference. And now we're getting asked week on week, can I use this service? Can we use this service? How can we increase this service? Which has been absolutely fantastic. So... <clears throat> Of course, as with any system, you have to look at what's taking place. And we have a, um, a survey that is used as part of the process. And we have 97% of individuals have said that yes, they would use near me again. So which is a, a brilliant situation to be in. Of course, as with anything, video consultation isn't necessarily appropriate for everyone. We have to look at this as an individual basis, but indeed, if we're having that amount of patients that are saying, yes, they'd like to use it, then we really ought to take it into consideration and see how we can do that for as many people as possible. So <clears throat> things that people have commented on, it's around being able to see people's face, it's been a great service, you're still using appointments, people haven't had to travel, Sound is, is okay, people aren't having to go to the hospital, it's reducing anxiety, it's reducing fatigue after appointments. So it really has been um, a valuable service. And indeed ensuring that families are still able to connect together to participate in appointments has been a valuable contribution too. Just last week, we've actually had um, the aim for what we're going to be doing in the future confirmed through Scottish Government. And that aim is that all health and care consultations are provided by near me whenever it is clinically appropriate. 
So that's a fantastic statement. That's a really positive drive forward. So that from now on, we can actually really look at each person's care and how that can be provided and whether we can do a blended approach that some appointments may be appropriate by near me and some may be physical appointments. But at least it's saying whenever clinically appropriate, let's look at using this as the way forward. And the rationale for that, <clears throat> the care professional can be at home, they can be at work. Our whole working pattern may change significantly in the future. So we need to look at how we can continue to provide that. And indeed, where will that patient be? They may be at school, at work or at home or at a local clinic. But the way in which we've worked over the last few weeks shows that clinically we can engage from a variety of different locations and we need to be able to continue with that. And of course, certainly for the, the short term, COVID-19 physical distancing will need to continue. So enabling this to, to use the likes of video consultation will be a huge asset. And that's for the clinical professionals, any professional and the individuals that they engage with. Additionally, as we've commented already, it ensures that this is a person centered approach, which means that we can meet the demands of individuals, looking at where they need to be to complete and participate appropriately in their appointments. What's suitable for that person? And thirdly, the environmental impacts. If we can reduce any travel, then that's a brilliant thing. That's the carbon footprint, but also there's all the <clears throat> additional attributes that go with that, the time that's taken, the way in which that can increase anxiety, the hassle for getting car parking spaces, the cost. They're all things that we ought to be taking into consideration for the people that we work with. And working differently, <clears throat> it enables patients to attend remotely. But as I've already said, it also enables the professionals to consult remotely. You can still have the same clinical team working with an individual, but it's just looking at things slightly differently. Who do we need to engage with? Who do we physically need to see? Or can we actually engage with people remotely? So where can we engage with NIMI? Just about anybody's pathway, any part that of the journey that they engage with. Primary care, social services, secondary care, community-based services and the third sector. Wider public sector, there is a potential for that but at the moment the NIMI license that we have is for health and social care purposes. But we've got a million interactions there that we can look at changing and introducing and considering. So where is, is the place of near me? Over the last few weeks, we've encouraged the use of telephone to ensure that we engage with individuals. That is that first, lane, lane, first line of contact um, to ensure that we haven't um, the opportunity to um, spread infection. Near me gave the opportunity for that additional opportunity to see people, certainly the, looking at people to check their pallor, their respiratory weight, and indeed how they are responding. So many visuals can be taken through the, the use of near me. And only using face-to-face -face when video consultation is insufficient, such as the need for a physical examination. So <clears throat> how might we use near me in the future? It could be part of an unscheduled care process, certainly part of the triage. As I've just commented, it gives you the opportunity to have those additional observations. It can give reassurance where somebody's anxious, and it also gives the opportunity to have that visual engagement with the person. It enables home visits to continue to take place without physically knocking on that front door. And the use within scheduled care, long-term condition reviews, 
medical reviews, mental health interactions, support and well-being, all of these areas can be changed dramatically by introducing and enhancing the use of video consultation. And then follow-up appointments, reviewing treatments, discussing results, following up on a procedure. There's lots of different aspects where we can actually consider using this. And it allows a three-way consultation, the individual with their professional, but then of course we can bring in a family member, a, um, a translation service, all sorts of different ways, a second professional. We can introduce more than just the one-to-one. -one. So things to consider, <clears throat> we need to look at what, what it is that we're doing and how we can introduce things. By building our own knowledge of the service that we engage with, what we do, how we do it, can we do it differently? We need to look at the system. What else do we engage with? Who else do we support? And what elements of that process can be undertaken virtually? There's still likely to be parts of some processes where we need to have a physical interaction, such as giving blood, but that may be just one part, whereas the rest of it we can actually do more remotely. So what's the human side of things? <clears throat> it may well be that some individuals can undertake a video consultation, but not everyone. Or we may need to adapt things slightly. So we need to understand the variation. Who is this suitable for? And that may well be that some individuals, our patients, our clients, some we can use this service, others it may not be appropriate but equally the understanding the variation of the colleagues that we work with and ensuring that they become comfortable with using this way of approach, making sure that they have the training and the opportunity to test and practice. So using Near Me, regardless of whether we're supporting a client to engage with their appointment or actually introducing and using Near Me for our own service, there's three aspects we need to consider the technical setup, the service processes, and individual training. So the technical setup, the person and the professional needs to have a reliable internet connection. That could be within, in their home, within their school, within their work, or a mobile device. We've certainly heard of people sitting in their car and participating in appointments. So indeed, we need to have that <clears throat> We need to have the opportunity to um, use any type of device. It can be a, a telephone, a computer, anything that you need to use. And to access, <clears throat> to access the system, you must have Google Chrome or Safari. And certainly from the professionals, um, sorry, from the clinical part for the individual, there's nothing to download. The citizen receives an app and that's all they need to have. And the service processes, you need to look at the route that the person's going to take. How do they walk in to their appointment? Is it through a referral? Do they have an appointment? Is it booked? Is it a drop-in service? How can we actually amend our system in order to use this process as part of it. Who's going to answer the near me call? Do we need to have a receptionist or can it go straight through to the professional? And what is the consultation process? Who else do we need to engage with? And then of course, once we've had that interaction, how do we follow up? Can our Rockheld systems actually take on board the fact that we've participated in a video consultation or do we need something else? And what are the follow-up arrangements? We need to ensure that that part of the process is complete. How do we tell the person, yes, a video consultation is appropriate on the next occasion too? The NEMI website, which is NEMI.scot, has lots of information which we can share with citizens. There are videos, there's opportunity to test, and there's more information on there too. So it's a really good thing to share with everybody. An individual training. As I say, the NEMI website gives information for our citizens, but it also has an aspect for professionals. 
that gives links to the Churas website and also links to tech. So there's lots of information on there. And also the National Video Conferencing Team website has information. And through all of those different opportunities, people can access information and resources to help them get going. So if you start to consider some next steps, we need to think about planning, we need to think about testing and evaluating and doing the good old PDSA sign calls, taking little steps at a time, working with one clinician, one patient, and then looking at how we can scale that up to supporting others or introducing it further. But it needs to be to start with to think about what we can do and then move forward. So are you going to consider your next steps or are you actually going to take some next steps? If you do want to talk about it, then please just get in touch and we'll provide what help we can. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Okay, Nessa, back to you. Thanks very much, Yvonne. That was really good. Um, I'm going to suggest that we go ahead with Nigel um, to give a little bit more detail about the work you're using near me for, but um, I know the work is, is much bigger than just about near me, and then we'll take the questions. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming through. Um, Yvonne, if you can see the chat function, you maybe want to have a look at those as well. Um, if not, I'll round them up at the end, and we will just hand over to Nigel. If you can do a full screen share, Nigel, if that's possible. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Nigel, off you go when you're ready. Oh, you were on slideshow and you've gone back. Can we go back to slideshow? Thank you. Yep, sorry, I was just unmuting myself. <laughs> um, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, is that okay, Nessa? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Nigel Henderson, and as Nessa says, I'm the Chief Executive of Penumbra. So. I want to just share with you today briefly um, how we've been using Near Me in one of our services called the Distress Brief Intervention. So by way of introduction, I just thought it would be important to tell you a little bit about Penumbra in case you don't know. So we are a, a mental health charity, uh, one of the largest mental health charities in Scotland. We have about 400 staff and we are absolutely delighted that 20% of our workforce are people who bring their own lived experience of mental ill health and recovery to their work as peer workers. Um, we work across Scotland in about 18 local authority areas and we like to think we have a, a significant history of innovation. A number of our services were the first of their kind. And each week we are supporting about 1,800 adults and young people. And that can be anything from a few hours to 24 seven. And in 2017, we were appointed as the Distress Brief Intervention, the DBI lead for Aberdeen City. Um, with the role to coordinate that, set it up and to deliver the service. So what is DBI? So it's been running as a pilot in four parts of Scotland since 2017, funded by Scottish Government. And this very much came out of the previous um, mental health strategy about looking at ways to uh, intervene earlier in people's distress before these became critical um, or crisis situations. So Aberdeen, Inverness, Lanarkshire, both north and south and Scottish borders are the pilot areas in the uh, current DBI program. And Lanarkshire also have the role of being what we call DBI central, which is where the, the core team that oversees the work of the pilot are based. So the idea was to work with four referral pathways. So that's primary care, the emergency departments, Police Scotland and the Scottish Ambulance Service. And we call these pathways DBI level one. And all the staff in those areas have to complete DBI level one training before making any referrals. 
So in Aberdeen, for example, we've trained over 150 police officers, uh, worked with the ambulance service and trained a number of their paramedics. Primary care, we've trained quite a lot of the GP practices, although not all. And again, working with the emergency department, um, some of their front lines, triage staff, but also with the psychiatric liaison team. And DBI level two is the third sector. So in Aberdeen, that's us. And we have to respond to referrals within 24 hours. And I'm pleased to say that since the program started, 100% of referrals have been responded to within 24 hours. University of Glasgow have developed and delivered the training for both level one and level two, and that's Professor Rory O'Connor's team in Glasgow. So the idea with DBI is that people can get support for up to 14 days from their first contact. And I think that's really important actually that you have that opportunity not to just have a one-off uh, telephone call or helpline or whatever, or an appointment with your GP, but actually that you have ongoing support. And obviously since mid-March, we have moved from face-to-face -face delivery of this service or largely face-to-face um, to telephone and online support only. And we gather quite a lot of data that shows us the efficiency or effectiveness and, and uh, um, so on for this service for both a monitoring and evaluation purpose so that we have some evidence about how DBI works. And currently the pilot program is only funded until next March and we're waiting for some further thoughts about how things continue beyond that. So earlier this year, probably towards the end of March, beginning of April, um, the government decided to commission a COVID response uh, through DBI, and that's funded for one year. And this is working with NHS 24, um, where NHS 24 have been developing a mental health hub, which is now operating seven days a week between the hours of 6 p.m. and 2 a.m. And so, on the 8th of June, we will be expanding the DBI COVID service across the whole of Scotland, um, all health board areas, and it will take referrals from the NHS 24 mental health hub. So we've created a new pathway in and all the support for that will be provided via telephone and video. And we've obviously set up and thought through the whole process about how referrals can be transferred securely and we will be using NHS.net for the, the um, process to refer people. So we've been using um, Near Me in Aberdeen for um, probably the last year and I have to say that originally it was uh, probably not that popular because people preferred the face-to-face -face or even telephone support and I think some of that was both down to staff on our side not necessarily feeling comfortable with it um, and therefore maybe not offering it or offering it in a sort of half-hearted way um, but since the lockdown we have seen increasing uptake and I think as we've all become more used with video platforms and how to hopefully mute and unmute ourselves and all the rest of it, um, we have seen an increasing uptake since the withdrawal of our face-to-face -face support. And I think for us it provides that secure, secure, confidential and safe platform. And I think it allows much more interaction than a telephone call. And from our point of view, you can also pick up on some of the, the physical cues from how people are, how people appear on screen and so on. So on. And I think the other thing is that we are obviously now seeing that it's really quite easy to access once you overcome that initial anxiety about using video conferencing. So this is our waiting area in DBI Aberdeen, and we are about to set up other waiting areas as we expand the service uh, across the country. Uh, we will be one of three providers providing the, the DBI, DBI COVID service, so SAMH and Sport and Mind Scotland will also be providing. We will be covering um, one, two, three, four, five, six health board areas, about 43% of the population, so we're pretty much down the east coast and across in Ayrshire and Arran and Orkney and Shetland uh, we will be covering. 
So that's very much what people see when they, they join, when they come into the waiting area. And, and then this would be the screen. This is actually staff that were doing a test one, but I thought I would just obscure their faces anyway, because I think that's just only fair. Um, so that's really just a video shot of a screenshot of what that would look like. But I think for us, one of the huge advantages is actually the ability to share your screen a bit like we are now because a lot of the work that we will do through DBI is actually helping people with a, a future um, keep safe sort of plan for managing their distress. So we will help people work through a distress management plan. And we can do that jointly, and it's obviously a lot easier if you can share that on screen. You can even then um, work through that and, and complete that together as, as you go along. And Probably what we're seeing is that between the point of referral and the 14 days that on average people will have four or five contacts with our staff to really work through the various issues that are causing them distress and to start thinking about how they plan for that. Um, we can also share other things like self-management tools and the, there's a whole DBI toolkit and within Penumbra we have our own what we call our HOPE toolkit. Um, and we have lots of tools, tips and techniques there that people can have and that the screen sharing function then becomes really important. So we've had some feedback. Um, this is more anecdotal sort of feedback that we've taken from people. Um, so staff have now found it quite easy to navigate. Um, and I think as Yvonne said, you know, it's good to put a face to a name. And actually, our staff see this as a way of actually establishing that rapport that is really important. There is a patient leaflet that provides simple and clear instructions for anyone wanting to access the virtual waiting room. Um, and that face-to-face -face support in the current situation is really good for us. And I think for the future, it also helps with people where we're supporting them in more rural parts or indeed where accessing an office or, or mobility issues or things like that might be an issue. And as I said, I think the screen sharing is, is a fantastic function there. So we've found it easy to set up and we will now set up other waiting areas so that we can have a number of calls. I think I saw on the questions about whether you could have a three-way conversation. That is certainly something we have done, um, particularly when we've got new staff and when they're shadowing. And obviously we ask the person's permission that the person can be there as well, but we can have three people in there. You could have four people, but I think, you know, it, 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 there is a limit to how many people you can have on at once. But the, the, certainly having three people there is, is easily achieved. And I think one of the things that people said to us was that knowing it was an NHS service actually gave them confidence. So I was talking to Yvonne last week about this and I think we're clear that we're not the NHS and therefore it's good to see that the logo now says near me, not NHS near me and that, that feels more appropriate. Some of our staff have raised issues about working from home when using this, about maybe if one of their children or something comes into the room or comes into shop. And I think that's a legitimate concern, but I think it's one that we have to work around and people can always cancel sharing their screen at that particular point if they need to um, deal with that particular challenge. But we are also aware that digital exclusion is an issue for some and people don't necessarily have good Wi-Fi connections, they don't necessarily have laptops, iPads or whatever um, that allows them to access this. And we're very clear that particularly for this service that it's best on a PC, tablet or laptop. But actually using it on a phone and doing screen sharing on a phone, whilst it's possible, is actually very difficult. So it's quite small. So wherever possible, we would encourage people to, to access it via a PC, tablet or laptop. But as I say, that's not necessarily available for all. And some parts of the country as well, internet connection is not particularly good. So I think there are challenges, wider challenges, not just for us, but for the whole sort of system around that. So that's really it in a nutshell. I'm quite happy to answer questions. I think in terms of our next steps, we're very keen to roll this out to more of our services. 
um, we're already using other platforms like Teams and Zoom and Skype and so on. But I think the fact that this is that, as I say, it's got that sort of NHS sort of seal of approval that resonates well with the public is something that actually would give us confidence to, to use this more often with people. Um, I think if you were asking me about um, future uses, I think there is additional functionality that could be added to the system, but we'll maybe pick that up in the, in the questions um, just now. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, back to you, Nessa. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you again to Vaughan. And we have several questions. So I am just going to share my own screen. Um, the reason for sharing that is because some of the resources which Yvonne has mentioned are accessible here and um, hopefully you can see those if you want to find out more details specifically around the implementation guides um, for Near Me and there are a range of resources available for a whole host of different settings um, that people can look at and use. Right, so just to crack into the questions, um, I've grouped a couple of them together and happy to share them further if we haven't got answers to all of these questions this morning in our limited time. Um, we had a couple of questions about the number of people who can be on a Near Me call and I know Nigel, you kindly um, helped to answer, partly answer that one. So I was just going to ask um, Yvonne if there is a limit um, is it possible to have a group session was one question and how many people can participate basically is the three-way consultation the limit? I think we've partially answered it, but Yvonne. Okay, thank you, Nessa. So um, I would say that actually you could probably do a four-way consultation in the sense that if you think that we sometimes have an individual so if it was myself, possibly as the person that needed support, I may say wish to have a family member with me. It may well be that then I speak to um, the professional person. Take Nigel's case where he says that, that he would have a member of staff there and possibly there would be a trainee participating there. So we can instantly see that there would be a four way engagement. Nimi, it doesn't really go beyond that and a four-way con conversation would be based on the connectivity within those individuals homes um, that may impact on the quality. If you wanted to go more than that and do group work then um, there are other alternatives that certainly within the NHS are available. Um, so yeah it would be a four-way situation maximum I would suggest. Um, sorry was that, was that cover all Nessa? That's good. Thank you. I'm going to keep going just because of the time. Um, if, if Apologies to anybody if that's not enough detail. If anybody wants to ask anything further, then please just get in touch with me separately afterwards. That's fine. Thank you. Um, the next one was um, quite specific about the clinical applications. So um, Jim Ferguson in Aberdeen, hi Ferg, has asked about using digital stethoscopes for consultation. Who has done it? Has anybody done it? And has it been successful? And I think Yvonne, you've got a yes. feedback. So it has been used in the Western Isles. Um, that sounded as though it was quite a, um, a large piece of kit that was enabling that to happen. And in Dumfries and Galway, um, they've started to test a stethoscope that literally just uses um, uh, a socket to plug into the computer. Um, They've done some very, some just limited testing, but again, Ferg, I can certainly get back in touch and let you know more details of that. They're the only two occasions that I'm aware of that it's been used though. Thank you. Um, and this is a question I think initially to Nigel, um, again from Ferg in Aberdeen, um, who's partly observation that in the early stages of using video enabled services in Aberdeen, at least um, for mental health, they found that a lot of people actually preferred um, attendance, sorry, attendance for face-to-face -face assessment was daunting and so they preferred the video enabled as consultation or assessment. Have you had any experience of that? So people preferring the digital over the face-to-face -face in person? It, it, it's been interesting because across the various um, pilot areas there's been a mixture of ways that we've responded to people. So um, for instance in Lanarkshire they tend to go out and uh, well, they make telephone contact with people first and arrange a meeting, but they tend to go and meet them at home. We haven't done that so much in Aberdeen. We've tended to ask people to come to us. And I guess because we're only covering the city, that's a bit easier than covering the whole of Lanarkshire. Um, 
And by and large, people have welcomed that coming to us rather than that. And I think, as I said, we haven't necessarily until now really pushed the, the video conferencing. But once I think people have overcome that initial anxiety, I think they, 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 they quite welcome it. So it is interesting. I mean, certainly I think the, the comfort. I, I heard a great description of um, a GP who was consulting someone who was sitting in their living room and lit a cigarette and the GP said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, sorry, doctor, I forgot I was at the doctor's. And I think that epitomizes how that video environment can be quite a relaxing experience for people because they feel safe in comfortable surroundings. So I would probably echo that that hopefully is the experience that people who might be experiencing mental health issues or anxiety issues and so on, that that comfort of being at home is actually quite um, powerful. Okay. Could I come on on that one as well, please, Nessa? Um, I, I totally echo um, what Nigel's saying. Um, however, we, and, and certainly rape crisis, um, they have seen um, a huge use of this and, and how that is supportive of individuals who wish to engage, but then they're feeling in, that they're in a safe environment to do so. Um, but certainly within some of the community environments, what we have found is that individuals may not actually live in suitable um, locations. So whether they actually have access to a private location to participate in a video consultation is something that needs to be considered. And um, you know, so basically is around that person-centered approach to talking to the person to check that they do actually have the opportunity to have a private space to participate. And there have been occasions as well where um, individuals may not actually have the connectivity within their own home to participate. So again, it's looking slightly wider at whether or not that person may be able to access a community facility that's local to where they live. And certainly in the country, we have some areas where libraries are starting to look to see whether or not people can use um, some of their uh, resource rooms um, to participate. So it's looking at the wider um, community facilities that may be in the location that somebody is in order to, to assist them. I do appreciate that might not be um, appropriate for the two o'clock in the morning service that Nigel's giving, but certainly for, for other people during the daytime. Thank you, Yvonne. And um, again, a question, I think both of you, but Nigel, you mentioned using a feedback questionnaire or certainly looking at the response of service users. Um, and also we had a question specifically around near me um, about a patient feedback questionnaire. Has that been administered or is it a function built into near me um, or both perhaps? Um, so if I go first to Nigel, are you doing specific feedback questionnaires for the video consulting element? So, no, we're not. Um, that was more just a, a random uh, collection of feedback that I got from some staff prior to this. So we haven't done that specifically. There is a lot of feedback and um, monitoring built into the DBI program, but not a specific question on the video conferencing. So that's possibly something we should be thinking about as we roll out this new service. Okay, and to Yvonne, thank you, Nigel. Okay, so um, yes, there is a questionnaire that's built into the Near Me service. Um, up until December 2019, we had been using Serving Monkey. Um, from January, we changed to using Questback, which is a service that's supported by Scottish Government, and that was all to do with GDPR issues. Um, we have information back from the Survey Monkey um, up to December. The um, the the more recent um, questionnaires we haven't been analysing in detail yet because we've just been engaged in supporting the rapid rollout under the COVID-19 situation. Um, but at least the new survey will be able to give us um, slightly more um, defined information. But again, it depends on the size of the service because we have to ensure that we have confidence um, that we have patient or patient or client confidentiality. So it depends on the numbers that we're getting back as to how much detail we'll be able to share and what we can how we can analyze that. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm just going to quickly check on the chat over here to see if we've captured everything um, and the questions that we've had. This morning, if anybody else has any last minute questions, we're just over our time. Um, you can either try and unmute yourself or put a quick, oh, I've got one quick one in. Um, so we had a question. 
to say as near me develops and expands across health and social care how do we reflect this in the language um, this is a question actually from Nigel Nigel I'm assuming that you mean by this um, not just referring to it as NHS near me or am I misinterpreting so uh, I think a couple of things um, the there's, there's a thing called the patient leaflet um, mm -hmm. we would not refer to people who use our services as patients um, and, and I think just generally the language is very much um, caught up in a very clinical environment. Mm -hmm. So even the aim that uh, Yvonne shared at the beginning about uh, um, developing it for where, where it's clinically appropriate, I would want to see us maybe think about, well, what would clinically appropriate equivalent be in social care? Mm -hmm. um, and how, how do we capture that? So that's what I mean by the, the language. Okay. In, <clears throat> yeah, wholeheartedly uh, take that on board, Nigel. Um, certainly, um, we are trying to, to look at how it can move out into um, more into social care settings. Um, so that's something I expect we will start to need to, to engage with and see how we can adapt the system. At the moment, I think um, I'm only aware that we can have specifics linked to um, set pages so there are system defaults whether or not we can then start to introduce um, different pages on that that's something we need to look at certainly if we're starting to look at um, a wide the wider population um, there are or there is already work commencing um, looking at the language in relation to creating leaflets and these may be things that lo are, are distributed locally, but we are looking at um, how leaflets can be created that are more children specific or um, may have more pictures for individuals who um, need to, to engage using more pictorial side of things and also how we can engage more with um, translation services to ensure that we're picking up with individuals whose like, um, English may not be their first language. Um, We've also um, raised um, and had assurances that people who, who use things like storyboards, they should be able to, if, that, if their computers are um, adapted for them to use such things, then they would be able to engage um, with the NIMI service using the adaptations that they have already on their PCs. So we are trying to look at how it can be um, utilised for the wider population. Okay, thanks very much Yvonne. Um, I'm going to call a halt then this morning to the first webinar of our week of webinars and just to say a very, very big thanks again to Nigel and Yvonne particularly for taking the time out to do this. I know it's not the same as a workshop but we didn't want to just not have our learning network activity um, for this week as we all know knowledge exchange especially at the times we're in is so important for us to all learn more about how to deliver these types of services so thanks to everyone who joined thanks to Yvonne and Nigel for delivering their presentations we aim to make the recording and the slides available um, within a few days via the tech website um, and I'll just obviously double confirm with the speakers that they're happy to share their slides as well as the recording because we had um, one or two comments about that in the chat. Thanks again, everybody, and um, maybe see you on another webinar this week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.